Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to another episode of Intuition. In this week's video, we're going to be solving some miscellaneous NAPLEX questions. Like I told you guys, I got your back, so stay tuned. All right, in today's video, we're gonna be answering three questions. So let's dive into it. Let's answer question number one. So question number one states, which of the following phenomena are part of the study of pharmacokinetics? So like all that apply. Okay, this question is straightforward, but in order to get it right, you need to know what pharmacokinetics is. And pharmacokinetics is the study of what the body does to the drug. And the easiest way to remember what pharmacokinetics is, is to remember the acronym ADME, A-D-M-E. And ADME stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So these are the different things that the body can do to a drug when a drug is consumed by a patient. So let's go through the answer choices to eliminate the wrong answers and select the right answers. Okay, answer choice A says, drug the solution in the GI tract. That's gonna be part of drug absorption, right? In order for the drug to be absorbed from the GI tract into the bloodstream, the drug first has to dissolve in the GI tract. So drug the solution is going to be part of the absorption process. And this will definitely be a pharmacokinetic process. So A would be correct. The second option is, drug receptor binding and signal transduction. Okay, so it says drug receptor binding and signal transduction. What does that mean? Every drug has a target, and when the drug binds to its target, it causes an effect to happen, which could be anything, right? From lowering your blood pressure, getting rid of your headache, or causing a decrease in inflammation, right? Whatever the drug does, the drug has to bind to its target and cause an effect. The question is, is that a pharmacokinetic process? Well, the answer is no, because drug binding and signal transduction, that's what the drug does to the body. That's not what the body is doing to the drug, that's what the drug is doing to the body. So that would be a pharmacodynamic process, not a pharmacokinetic process. So B would not be selected. C says, breakdown of drug by CYP P450 enzymes in the liver. Okay, clearly that's metabolism, right? So when a drug comes into the body, the drug has to be metabolized and excreted. The main enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing drugs are the CYP P450 enzymes, the cytochrome P450 enzymes. So this will definitely be part of the metabolism and metabolism is a pharmacokinetic process because that's what the body is doing to the drug. The body is metabolizing the drug, okay? So this will be a correct answer as well. And finally, we have accumulation of a lipophilic drug in adipose tissue. Again, this is discussing a process of what the body is doing to the drug because the drug is lipophilic, the body is going to the body is going to accumulate this drug in fatty tissue, which is the same thing as adipose tissue. So this process falls under the category of drug distribution, which is part of ADME, and ADME is part of pharmacokinetics. So this will fall under drug distribution, and it will definitely be a pharmacokinetic process. All right, so these are the correct answers. Okay, let's go on to question number two. Question number two states. Which of the following outcomes will be classified as ratio data? Select all that apply. Okay, ratio data. When it comes to ratio data, two main things that you need to know is that ratio data is continuous. It's continuous and ratio data has an absolute zero. And by absolute zero, it means that this data does not take on negative numbers. Zero is the lowest value that this data can take on. So knowing these two things about ratio data, let's go through the answer choices to figure out which answers are correct. Okay, answer choice A says, Temperature measured in Celsius. Is that ratio data? Celsius is a continuous scale, right? And where does Celsius start? It starts at negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, and it can go all the way up to basically infinity, right? So temperature in Celsius is definitely continuous. Now, does it have an absolute zero? No, it doesn't, right? Because temperature on a Celsius scale can take on negative numbers. For example, zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water, but you can have lower temperature than that, right? Because the freezing point of water is not the lowest temperature that you could possibly have. Because remember what temperature is. Temperature is molecular motion. If a temperature of zero truly corresponded to reality, then that temperature of zero will correspond to zero molecular motion. But we know that zero degrees Celsius does not correspond to zero molecular motion because we can have lower temperatures than zero degrees Celsius. So which means that even at zero degrees Celsius, there's still molecular motion. And therefore, temperature in Celsius does not have an absolute zero value. And it's not going to be ratio data. It's going to be interval data, not ratio data. So A will be incorrect. 
Okay, let's take a look at B. B says temperature measured in Kelvin. Here we go again with another temperature data, but this time the temperature is measured in Kelvin. Does Kelvin have an absolute zero value? Yes, it does, right? Kelvin starts at zero degrees Kelvin and it can go all the way up to infinity. So it's definitely continuous and it has an absolute zero, which means that you cannot have a temperature lower than zero degrees Kelvin because zero Kelvin corresponds to zero molecular motion. Because it has an absolute zero and because it's continuous, temperature in Kelvin scale would be ratio data. So temperature in Kelvin would be a correct answer. Let's go on to C. Patient height measured in centimeters. First thing, is that continuous? Yeah, that's continuous data, right? Because a person theoretically could be any height. Now you have to ask, does it have an absolute zero value? Zero height corresponds to a true absolute value of having no height. Height cannot take on negative values, right? You can't have a negative height. You can only have zero height or a height greater than zero. So height would definitely correspond to ratio data. And finally, we have pain relief measured on a one to 10 scale. Okay, one to 10 scale. Already we can see that this is not continuous because it has a cutoff at 10. And also with pain scale data, it's subjective, which means that it doesn't truly correspond to something that we can objectively measure. It's a subjective measurement. So pain scale will not, it's not going to be ratio data. It's going to be ordinal data. And this is not going to be a correct answer. Our correct answers were temperature in Kelvin and measurement of height. All right, let's go on to question number three. Okay, question number three states, drugs typically expire by chemical decomposition. Which of the following changes in a chemical reaction will lead to faster drug expiration? Select all that apply. Whenever a manufacturer makes a drug, the shelf life of that drug is going to be determined by how quickly this drug decomposes. And there are a lot of different factors that can cause a drug to decompose, right? Uh, it can decompose through oxidation, it can decompose through hydrolysis by interacting with water. So there are lots of different chemical reactions that can cause a drug to degrade. And now we're being asked to select the chemical parameters that will cause a drug to degrade faster. So answer choice A says, increase in activation energy. Activation energy is basically the potential energy that a reaction has to overcome to get the reaction to occur. So if you have a very low activation energy, then that means that that's a very low barrier and it's very easy for the reaction to occur because it's very easy to get over that low barrier. But if you increase the activation energy, then you make it harder for that chemical reaction to occur because it has to because it has to cross a higher bridge to be able to go from products to reactants on the other side. So answer choice A will be incorrect because it would actually make the drug expire slower, not faster. B says increase in temperature. Clearly this is going to cause a chemical reaction to occur faster, right? Because temperature increases molecular motion and it causes more collisions to occur. And the more collisions that occur between molecules, the faster, the faster chemical reactions occur. So B will be correct. All right, C. C says increase in humidity. Humidity is basically an increase in the pressure of water. Whenever you have an increase in pressure, pressure causes molecules to move closer to each other. And the closer they are together, the more likely they are to react with one another. So increase in pressure or humidity would definitely cause chemical reaction to occur faster as well. And finally, D says, significant decrease in pH. Very extreme levels of pH, whether it's very high or very low, is going to catalyze chemical reactions because, because very low pH means that there's a higher concentration of protons. And a proton is a positively charged chemical and charged chemicals are very reactive. So very low pH will definitely lead to a higher rate of drug decomposition and drug expiration, okay? So these would be the correct answer. So all the answers would be correct except for, increase in, except for increase in activation energy. All right, so there you guys have it. For those of you who are still studying, I wish you guys the best of luck. But if you've been watching these videos, if you've been following the, if you've been following the explanations that we give you guys and the logic that we go through to get you to understand the concepts behind the questions, you have nothing to worry about. This exam is gonna be a piece of cake for you. All right, so hopefully you guys continue to watch and uh, continue to hang in there. All right, I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.